Good afternoon. Welcome back from the uh, break. I hope everyone had a good break. My name is Robert Gailey. I teach in the School of Business at Point Loma Nazarene University, which is here in San Diego on Point Loma area. I also direct the Center for International Development, and uh, we engage uh, students in looking at business, what we say is business to serve the least of these, to talk about the poorest three billion people in the world and say how can business practices and principles be used to help uh, people in poverty. Uh, in light of the way that the session's been going on all day today, we're gonna shift the, the uh, framework just a little bit. Uh, this uh, first of all, this panel is a little different in that we have two moderators. Uh, so my colleague, uh, Dr. Roger Bingham, is over there. He's going to take over kind of the moderation of the, the discussion of the panel uh, after the introductions. Um, I'm just going to be doing the introductions. I might jump in with a question or two, but uh, we have a distinguished group of panel uh, that I'm going to uh, refer you, like we've been doing, to the, the catalog or the, the schedule for their actual details. I had actually written out a bunch of bios that had a lot of details, and as I saw how today was going, I told the panel I'm going to switch it up on them, okay? And I'm going to ask you to do an introduction, not necessarily on your bio, you can mention the organization you're with, but to actually talk about a story, a quote, an experience that made you inspired to get involved in something in which your current research and work is involved in. We have nonprofits, for-profit corporations and educations looking at the issue of um, empowerment. And the title of our, 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 our session is Alliances for uh, Social Inclusion, Challenges and Actions. So just like last session was about collaboration, this is also about alliances. I've been involved in the San Diego Microfinance Alliance as well as some of the panelists here have been as well, uh, where we've come together, educational institutions, nonprofits, um, wanting to consider uh, about interest in study and uh, understanding better microfinance. So I'm gonna start with a very quick story based on what I've been hearing already as my panel uh, can think through how they wanna introduce themselves with a story. Uh, basically, it's in uh, light of my childhood, and I don't have as nearly as uh, compelling stories as what we've heard already the, today. So uh, I just want to uh, announce that up ahead. Uh, but uh, I, I will tell you, uh, I remember not when I found out Santa Claus wasn't real. That did not bother me at all. Wait, Be what? Because I still got presents, et cetera. <laughs> What bothered me, yeah, I'm so sorry, so sorry to, to uh, what bothered me was when I found out the superheroes that I was watching on cartoons that they were just drawings, and that they were not real people. And the reason was, not that I cared about having Superman or, or uh, Green Lantern or whoever else it was, it, my concern was, well, who gets the bad people? If the good people aren't real, the, the superheroes aren't real, then I just have to rely on the police and all that? No, I'm not a superheroes because there's bad people out there. As I've grown older, and as I've heard this story here uh, shared, is I try to teach my kids and I try to talk to my students that I don't call anyone a bad people anymore. A lot of people say, oh, they're bad people, or they're bad people out in the world. There's not bad people. There are people who make bad choices. And there are people who make good choices. And as we just heard in the last session, you can make the choice that is a positive thing day in and day out. You have the, the right and the privilege and the honor to do that. And that really at the essential core of what who people are is they want to be loved and they want to love. And if you allow them to then take the choice, good choices. So that means someone who is a good person could do harm to one of my children by making a bad choice at a moment in time. And it also means that a bad, what the society calls as bad people could actually show kindness and love and care. So I said there's not good people and bad people, there are people who make good choices and bad choices, and therefore it's a day-by-day -day decision that we choose to make good choices. And so that's the, the, the lesson, the thing that inspires me to be involved in these kind of things. It, it speaks to collaboration and alliances, is to make the choices to, to give up our pride, to give up our position and say, we can work together, we can work across the aisle, we can work with nonprofits and for-profits, we can do this together. So. I'm going to ask my panel from the very beginning, uh, Dr. Huma Ahmed uh, Ghosh, to start with a story and then just come across, and then we'll have uh, Dr. Bingham to actually uh, ask the questions to the panel. So this is, I'm going to keep this really brief. 
But uh, I am where I am today, sitting here especially. Uh, I have to give credit to my parents. So they studied in England in the 1950s. One was an economist, the other an anthropologist, signed socialist members, and I grew up with you know, discussions about development, Marxism, et cetera, and then ended up in a Marxist university. So from early on in my childhood, uh, no, not really. Early on in my childhood, I thought women ruled, and then I was in an all-women's uh, school and college, and I continue to think that all women rule till I went to postgraduate education and realized, wait, there's another species out there that wants to control us. <laughs> so <laughs> given uh, my Marxist and feminist background, I am here and um, continue to work uh, towards uh, issues of that pertain to social justice, feminism, uh, gender war and peace, and women in development, etc. So um, my, my story is a very simple one. I was an exchange student in high school with uh, AFS, which probably most of you know. I think it's the biggest uh, high school exchange program in the world. And so I grew up in Colorado. I had a very uh, Midwestern upbringing in most respects. And then I went to Kenya for a year. And I lived with a host family. And I went to the local school. And uh, it was a completely transformative experience for me. And even though I've ended up working in a way that is fairly cerebral and mathematical and technical, uh, it created kind of a set of human linkages and a set of stories about, you know, why does business opportunity matter for people who are struggling as entrepreneurs? Why does education access for high school girls matter? And what happens to girls' lives when they're denied those opportunities? So very much it was, it was the experience that launched me on everything that I've done subsequently in my life. So send your kids overseas when they're when they're. <laughs> 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 Well, I certainly love to travel, um, and it has brought me far. Um, certainly, I've been inspired by a number of the women entrepreneurs that I've had the opportunity to work with in Southeast Asia, Africa, and India. And it really uh, started um, way back when, uh, when I was a young child, and, and my mom got uh, my sister and I go traveling quite a bit. Uh, she was putting, uh, working two jobs, putting my dad through school, had gone to apply for a credit card and filled it out with her name first because she was the one working and uh, my dad's name second, slid it across the counter and the woman said, oh no honey, you have to put your husband's name first. And She got so mad and she left and she went to a payphone and she called 1-800-NOW and the woman at the other end from the National Organization of Women said, doesn't that make you mad? And my mom said, yeah, what are you gonna do about it? I'm never gonna go back there again. So I grew up with these stories and with a mom who loved to travel taking me um, then on to college, uh, where I was asked to write a dream resume. And for some reason I picked, I wanted to be a director of corporate affairs for Qualcomm. And at the time, I really didn't know what Qualcomm did, certainly not about the wireless technology. It was because of that darn football stadium. And I had gone there, and, and I saw, said, thought to myself, wow, Qualcomm is this company that nobody really knows much about, but they're purchasing the rights to this stadium to give back Back to the community in some ways. And then the PR and media all of a sudden become aware of Qualcomm, and there's a certain kind of giving back that the company does. I thought that was interesting. So fast forward through my school and, and graduate school where I studied intercultural communications and feminist theory, and I got to Qualcomm, and I said, okay, I'm here, what do you have for me? And it turns out there's this really great program that I think some of you in the audience know about, our wireless reach program. And uh, through that program, I've had the opportunity to go abroad overseas and help work with women at the base of the pyramid um, and watch them lift their families out of poverty um, and have a brighter future. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elizabeth. And I'll tell you two parts of my story, and I'm going to skip the middle. But it starts with being um, a young child. And in my family, uh, volunteering and being part of our community was part of my weekly and monthly life. And so I think the interest in working in a community-based and nonprofit organization started at that age. And when I graduated from college, I knew that I wanted to actually work in the nonprofit field. And one of the things that I 
I did while researching nonprofits was that I really wanted to be part of a nonprofit organization that provided the tools that ultimately gave people resources to build their own self-sustainability. And I found Axion initially internationally because I had dreams of working all over the world and travel and all of that, all of that. And then I ended up finding that they had operations in the United States. And I said to myself, I'd really like to make a difference where I'm living locally and what I'm what I'm doing and being grained in that community. And I fast forward, I, I had walked into to Axion uh, and basically asked for an informational interview with the president at the time and uh, said, this is where I want to work. And um, she didn't have a position and I was persistent after months and months and months and finally something opened up. And I've been in three different positions, but I'll share with you the reason that I'm here today leading this organization is that one of the first weeks on the job that I worked with Axion, I walked into one of our entrepreneurs' uh, places of business, and it was a barber shop. And we had we had actually uh, given them a loan to start the barber shop. And what I recognized about the work that I was doing is it wasn't just about the loan that we had given that person to start his business. It was the fact that he was not only cutting hair in that business, he was turning that barber shop into a community hub where community issues, conversations were getting resolved and discussed. He was turning around and teaching kids in his community how to have a life outside of gang activities where they could get education. And ultimately, I realized that through the work of Axion, there is a butterfly effect from entrepreneurs that happens uh, with our work. And I get to experience that every day working with our entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Great introductions. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Ghosh, could you please uh, share a little bit more about the research you've been in and uh, just your reaction to the uh, topic that we're discussing about alliances for social inclusion? Yeah, I'll be coming more from an academic background, but uh, I have uh, traveled much. And I want to really complicate the whole issue of empowerment. What does it mean? What is, it is there something called economic empowerment, or are there many more components? And so I want to really briefly talk about the very crowded intersection or crossroad um, on which women's empowerment is poised or dithers or is teetering, you know. And one of the defining components of this intersection definitely is financial inclusivity. But another one is also a deep understanding of the social, sociocultural environment in which we engage with this kind of inclusivity. And so to, um, what I want to do is go back to my work in India, which was decades ago uh, for my PhD research. I came to the US for my PhD in anthropology. And I went back to India to do research on development and women. The word women hadn't been replaced by the word gender then. And now gender means even something else. So I'm glad I'm sticking with the word women. And um, uh, so, you know, I had this assumption through all my theoretical readings and understanding that with economic development, women's status improves. And I went to this uh, village in North India, and I found that everything just flipped around when I did my interviews. I was an, I'm an anthropologist, so I had to live in the village for a year. And it threw me off as a young person. I thought, since my hypothesis cannot be proved, I won't get my PhD. But I hung in there, and uh, I found that there was a, the example. The reason I want to give this example to show you how complicated social cultural things can be is that the lower caste. I don't know if how many of you are familiar with the caste system in India. You can always Google it later if you're not just now. I, you know, I don't have the time to explain it because they're giving me only five minutes. But um, um, I found that the higher caste women who owned, whose families owned the land were working on the land, and the lower caste women who used to be the agricultural workers were staying home and covering their heads, et cetera. And I said, oh, this is you know, not what I thought it would be like with economic development. And what economic development had done is that the lower caste men had started leaving the village for day labor in the neighboring towns. And since they were not dependent on the higher caste anymore, they were bringing in money and asking their laborer wives to stay home and cover their heads. So what was, and in the, at the same time, because that created a shortage of labor, 
labor, the higher caste women had to work in their own fields, and that was not remunerated labor. Another thing that I found was that the higher caste families were withdrawing their daughters from education because they said the higher the education of our daughters, the more highly educated grooms we will have to look for, and the more highly educated the grooms, the higher the dowry. <laughs> so, and the lower caste families were educating the daughters because they were willing now to give dowries. So what economic development was doing here was pushing the lower caste to emulate the Brahmanic or the higher caste social norms because those cultural and social norms were the valued norms. Am I clear? So even though from a feminist perspective or a Western, they were more oppressive on the women, within their cultural cohort, it was the preferred. And so that opened up a lot of questions that what do we really mean by empowerment, economic empowerment, who and what, if women themselves prefer to withdraw from income generating or income creating opportunities because within that cultural cohort, they want to be socially recognized. So this is just, I'm showing on an example that threw me off. Uh, then uh, I finished my PhD, I got a job, all of that happened. And uh, off late for the last 12 years, this is to show you another example to complicate the whole thing. I've been working in Afghan, if, I'll say it again. I say Afghanistan, but I know that for most people I have to say Afghanistan. So when I was working in Afghanistan, um, I again went from here to study human rights and women's rights are human rights and all of that kind of stuff. And again, everything turned on its head. So obviously I'm not getting the right education or there's something wrong with me. <laughs> and uh, I was, of course, by then, I had been in the field of feminism and teaching and women's studies and all for a, a decade at least. And uh, I came up with the strange realization because uh, I wasn't able to do much of the research I wanted to. But it turned out even better. Most of the NGOs asked me to help them write proposals. This is 2003 to 2010, where uh, they were applying for grants to donor agencies in the Western countries. And even if they were uh, applying for a grant to build a school, they, I had to write a paragraph for them on women's rights and girls' education, even if it was for anything else. Because they said the donor agencies will not give them money, because they're dictating the kind of thing we want to see. You know, like Susan Davis is not here now, so I can say it. Um, you know, 50% of the women are oppressed. Give me a break. Let's look in our backyard what's going on. You know what I mean? And so this helping kind of internationalizing of you know wars and crisis has been very problematic for me. And I realized that in Afghanistan after, sorry, Afghanistan, after so many years of research that we have to look at women's issues very cautiously because they are part of a kinship system, of a clan, of a tribal group. They're an integral part of a family structure where separating them out or little girls out does not serve a purpose or teaching them economic skills. Because with the microcredit loans that I checked over while I was doing my research there, the men were setting them up. They knew women are getting these privileges, but they were taking the money. Mm -hmm. uh, with the girls' education, the schools were getting bombed. You know, big deal, you build them, they get bombed. So I suggested, uh, we were outside Kandahar, and I was with this NGO, I said, why don't you build a school? And so the boys and the girls will go to school. And in the morning, you send the young boys to school, because that's when the mothers need the daughters to help with the household work. And in the afternoon, you send the girls. And they won't bomb the school because they want the boys to be educated. So the strategizing has to be very culturally appropriate. We have to understand, with my example of the caste system and what's going on with the gender issues, is because you know if we're really, really pushed, all of us will say no to this question. But if you have a son and daughter and only one can go to school, who would you send? You know. 
the son maybe yeah no daughter so these are the ground level realities of most people and so we have to understand that cultural background and you know i mean i'm going to tell you i had another surprise stop me mid sentence when i'm done uh, uh, is that um, i organized a big uh, conference in uh, india for all the so for about 20 afghan ngo women leaders and uh, some pakistani and indian to talk about regional cooperation and uh, some of the indian ngo leaders talked women talked about secularism and rights and women's rights and all of that and you know how islam is whatever it's supposed to be in the west and uh, the afghan ngo leaders said but we don't want secularism and it came as a surprise to me i'd been going there for some years because the only secularism they knew was through the russians and then the american occupation hmm. so i mean it lit up a bulb in my head too is that if you listen to the people and what they want and what the framework what is the framework they want to use for empowerment it shifted my research now i look at afghan uh, women run ngos who are strategizing strategizing women's rights within an islamic framework mm. and that has now led to my more recent work which is gendered violence and conflict uh, using afghanistan and my co-authors using palestine to talk about the larger issues of patriarchy of power and the reinforcement of some of that through through international assistance we have to be very very cautious and uh, bottom line i think my time is up is we need to listen to the voices down there but we do critically need to understand the cultural parameters within which they live work and have to survive and strategize economic and empowerment accordingly because empowerment is having the ability the decision making abilities within the household if women don't have that they are not empowered because then they have the social and cultural oppression plus the double burden of being the breadwinner in some of the microcredit uh, examples in afghanistan and i am a big supporter of microcredit we take students to bangladesh to the gramin bank is that the men know that these international agencies are going for empowering women and so they put them forward mm -hmm. so they end up doing the work outside the house and inside the house but they don't have any decision making power and another for me sign of economic empowerment for women is that they earn enough money to have what i call disposable income or income or saving that they prioritize for themselves because if all of the income is going in maintaining the household it does not ascribe any status to them okay so, thank, thank you. you so much <laughs> Dr. McIntosh, you've also done research in microfinance, uh, and you uh, want to share about some of your research you've been doing. Great. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll start maybe from a very different perspective and then end up in a, in a quite a similar place. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a development economist, and I would say that I'm a part of a movement that is taking place now across lots of the social science disciplines and uh, very much spearheaded by people at UCSD, which is really trying to take an extremely careful, empirical approach to understand understanding what works. So rather than kind of hypothesizing from grand principles, you work very closely with organizations to get down on the ground and to implement programs in a way that create control groups, that create someone you can compare the people who are benefiting from a program to, to say, does it really work? It's a very practical way of thinking, and it's a way of working that creates a lot of linkages between academic institutions, funders in the rich world, implementers on the ground, uh, survey firms on the ground. So every one of the projects that we do, in a certain sense, uh, uh, sort of an, an elegant example of these kinds of international linkages to try to understand empowerment. Now that's the positive view of it, and I'll come around and take the negative view of it at the end. So I think within development economics, the, the most uh, cogent voice in terms of thinking about empowerment is certainly that of Amartya Sen. And basically Sen's very simple approach is to say, instead of arguing about, you know, should we measure PPP per capita GDP? How do you measure money? How do you measure wealth? You basically say, development is the expansion of human freedoms. 
And so it's a sort of a unifying framework that allows you to think about gender empowerment, allows you to think about class empowerment, allows you to think about ethnic empowerment, economic empowerment within a, same, a single framework, which is people get better off as their freedoms expand and as their choice set expands. So uh, I think that this has allowed people to take two different approaches to gender and development economics. One of them is normative, and it is based on the idea that in and of itself, gender empowerment is a good thing and is something that we should be working for. But there's a second very important strain, which is to say that you know women are instrumental to many of the changes that we want to see in the world and many of the things that are becoming most clear from the research. So for example, the incredible importance of the first thousand days of a child's life on what happens to their subsequent cognitive development, their economic opportunities, et cetera, right? So the more studies that are done on exposure to malnutrition and pollution and stress and conflict at that very young age, the more we realize these things have permanent effects, right? So how is it that you target children and try to benefit children at that very vulnerable, important age is very typically going to be through women. Microfinance, one of the major justifications for microfinance has been research showing that you know the marginal dollar in a man's hand is more likely to go outside of the household and the marginal dollar in a woman's hand is more likely to be invested inside the household. So these are examples of ways where I may not care about, in a sense, women qua women. It's not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. And I think both of those are important things to keep in mind, that they're both very reasonable justifications for why pro-female development policies make sense, right? Makes sense for women, and it actually makes sense in a lot of other ways as well. So empowerment, obviously, is an idea that takes many forms. Uh, as an economist, I most naturally think about economic empowerment. So worldwide, women make 75% of what men make. 70% of the human beings on Earth that are living on less than a dollar a day are female. Lots and lots of research lately that has been focusing on vulnerability rather than just poverty. How hard do you get hit by shocks and how long does it take you to recover from shocks that hit you? How much are you cutting yourself to the bone in order to protect yourself from economic shocks? Lots of evidence that women are more vulnerable on the margin than men in lots of societies. And so the whole social protection agenda, which has become a very big deal in places like the World Bank, is a gender agenda in the sense that it's attempting to protect people from vulnerability. So there's economic empowerment. There's demographic empowerment, right? So the World Bank estimates that there are 6 million women who go missing every year mm -hmm. on the face of the earth. So 23% are never born, 10% are missing by early childhood, 21% are missing in the reproductive years, and 38% above the age of 60, excess mortality over what we should see. Okay, so stark demographic inequality that you can see just in head counts by ages across countries. And then there's institutional uh, empowerment. How do you help the institutions that are domestic institutions that come up from the ground and that are built by women or by women's organizations in order to be able to create empowerment, right? So that's, that's the tough piece. And in a way, I want to try to kind of return to that at the end. So I mean, the good news in a sense is that gender empowerment is very firmly on the agenda of the big international organizations. As was said, you know, every grant now has to be talking about what you're doing about gender. By my count, eight out of the 17 new SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are, are directly mm -hmm. related to gender. So this is by no means a peripheral issue. So then the good thing about this empirical agenda is we are actually coming up with answers to the questions, what works? What do you do about it? How do you create empowerment? So let me just run through a set of things that, that uh, are, are coming out as being very effective. So conditional cash transfer programs have been shown to be extremely effective at increasing secondary education for girls almost everywhere in the world that they've been tested, okay? So they're very targetable. It's very easy to go into a specific country and say, what is the age at which girls are leaving school and then come to their parents and give tra cash transfer programs to the parents that they only receive if they keep the girls in school. It's a very easy program to implement. It's a very effective program. It's been demonstrated to work everywhere it's been tried. Um, we ran a study in Malawi that gave unconditional cash transfers and we showed an enormous effect on a lot of outcomes for adolescent girls just from having like $10 a month in the household in the hands of the girls. They were less susceptible to sexual pressure. They contracted HIV at a third the rate there were less teenage pregnancy, there were fewer teenage marriages, so lots and lots of surprisingly large effects coming from small kinds of economic empowerment. Um, there's a whole social protection agenda, workfare programs, 
uh, various kinds of cash transfer programs, programs like Enrega in India, which has mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of beneficiaries. Again, all of these programs can be rethought in a gender sensitive way. Microfinance, I think, is going to be talked about by better minds than mine, so I'll, I'll not say much. I mean, there's been some big recent studies that have shown that there's not an enormous effect of microfinance on gender empowerment that is easily measurable, mm -hmm. and yet it is clearly expanding mm -hmm. the choice sets that women have in terms of the kinds of actions that they're able to take. And so from a SEND perspective, it's a positive thing. And then two programs that have been uh, kind of coming into the news in the last few months, targeting the ultra poor. So these are like mm -hmm. asset transfer and training programs for incredibly poor, vulnerable people, usually women, showing big effects on long-term transitions out of poverty. And then life skills and vocational training is another kind of intervention, another lever that can be moved that has been shown to have big effects on allowing adolescent girls to make the transition into being business owners, economically productive individuals with, with economic self-determination. So I think there's a lot, of exciting, a lot of exciting research out there and a lot showing that these things can work. So the conclusion that I want to make that's a little bit more pessimistic is that there's sort of two dimensions in which I feel uncomfortable about the alliance uh, and, and, and what are we doing in terms of kind of the, the political economy of how these research projects and interventions work. So the first of them is, in order to get rigorous evidence, we're usually doing randomized controlled trials. Mm -hmm. And randomized controlled trials require this incredibly rigorous top-down control of what happens on the ground. And a lot of these kinds of, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom and, and community empowerment things, they, they don't work like that. You can't have a randomized controlled trial work like that. So there's something antithetical between the issue of, like, you know, empowerment and engagement and these things kind of taking off of their own volition and the research design. But then at a deeper level, you know, as let's say a white American man, I frequently hit a point of discomfort in terms of social engineering. Mm -hmm. So I feel comfortable coming in and talking about the design of financial services. I feel comfortable talking, coming in and talking about the design of social protection programs. But when these programs explicit purpose is, for example, to shift the power dynamics inside a marriage, you're messing with something yeah. that you don't understand. Exactly. And I think that as a foreigner, you always have to have that humility of knowing mm -hmm. what you don't know. Yeah. The law of unintended That's consequences yeah. will always rule what happens in these cases, mm -hmm. right? So you economically empower mm -hmm. women in households, but and the men say, fine, big shot, you pay the school yeah, fees, exactly. and you've ended That's up leaving I'm someone saying. better That's off, right? Yeah. You allow women to conceal contraceptives from their husbands, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so they're able to control their own fertility. Yeah. But the outcome of using contraceptives is of course observable to the husband. And so you come in and you do your nice study and then what happens two or three years later when mm -hmm. people aren't getting pregnant, what's happening, what are you doing? Yeah, so so I, I think basically what I want to say is that like yeah. lasting cultural change comes from within a society. Yeah. And so speaking as a foreigner, you know, there are a set of things that are legitimate for us to be experimenting with and researching and trying to understand. There are a set of things which we should be standing back and saying, this is the legitimate cultural preserve of citizens and citizens mm -hmm. only. And so one can play a supportive role, but it's a supportive role from the outside. And so I think I, I just would basically conclude on that point of separating policy levers yeah. from the deep underlying goal of cultural exactly. change. And who is legitimate actor in each of those two spaces? Are, are, are different. All right, thank you. Very much. We should work together. <laughs> Aaron, why don't you share with us about the work at Qualcomm that you're doing? Certainly, happy to do so. Just even piggybacking off of some of the topics that my fellow panelists have talked about, um, when we talk about issues of financial inclusion, um, of economic development, um, of you know the lessons learned and the challenges um, that are out there in the field. For us, what we've been doing is looking at how we can use mobile as, a lar as one of the largest platforms we have to reach uh, humans and, and women in particular around the world. Um, so you're looking at you know seven billion phone subscriptions um, that are available. And through that is actually a form of empowerment. So some of the specific programs that we've wor worked on in Southeast Asia 
Um, so one of them with Grameen Foundation in Indonesia to help replicate the village phone program that came out of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. um, we learned a lot of lessons throughout the course of that program. You know, one of the things that we would try to do is align ourselves with the local governments, um, policies and goals to make sure that whatever type of program we would implement would be something that would be able to be sustainable uh, in the long term after our funding, um, you know, is not is not there. So we went in um, with our partners with Grameen Foundation, with the local 3G operator, and we were providing um, the, the, the small loans to women entrepreneurs at the base of the pyramid. Um, what we quickly found out as much, uh, much as what our panelists were talking about is that the women were quick to not only repay those loans for that mobile device, but then they were very quick to um, be able to market that device um, and the services that you have through that mobile device um, throughout their community. What we observed is truly these women working in and what was a human type of network. So a woman in a village has a mobile phone, her community now knows about it, so they're coming to her to use that device. And that device it can be looked at as a lot of different things. It could be looked at as um, a way of uh, personal safety because they know that they could use the phone to call somebody for help. Um, it could be used as a form of entrepreneurship and of making money. Uh, for instance, um, some of the women in the village would um, use a job application in which her fellow villagers would come to her, say, these are the types of skill sets I have. Uh, she would input that in her device, and then she'd get a message back saying where that person could go and work for the, for the day. Um, and so therefore, she was not only making money by helping place that person with a job, but she was helping empower her community by able to make money as well. Um, so we've seen that in Indonesia. Uh, in Malaysia, we've worked with women, um, small to medium-sized enterprises, giving them mobile devices as a tool to be able to market and promote their products and services, and also to be matched with mentors from around the world. Um, in the Philippines, uh, in terms of financial inclusion, giving women mobile devices that can use them as a mobile wallet. So now when you have a typhoon, or an earthquake hit and you're worried about the cash that you have being destroyed, you actually will have you know, that electronic bank account. So, so you can use mobile for all of these different types of things in order to empower women. Um, so we've done a couple of research studies um, with uh, one of the associations based out of Europe that focuses on telecommunications and looking at what types of results can having mobile broadband access give to women entrepreneurs. And we were able to segment it out into a lot of different types of women and what types of business, what types of services do they need their mobile devices for. Um, and what we learned out of that study, it was an in-depth study with over a thousand different participants from Nigeria, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Malaysia, and China, is we learned that these women were ready and willing to go and buy the devices and pay for the service plans if only they had that little boost to get them over that barrier to entry. So what that made us go back and think about, okay, as a private sector organization, what can we do to help them get over that barrier? Well, let's talk with our, I sit in government affairs, let's talk with our contacts um, within governmental organizations and see if there's something you can do to help bring down um, the cost. Um, in Indonesia, we're facing something uh, that you can actually, it's a luxury tax in order to have a mobile device. So you're looking at many people at the base of the pyramid who barely have enough money would like to buy a phone with that, but then they're going to get taxed as a luxury to be able to, to buy that. So we're going up against those types of regulatory mm -hmm. issues and trying to address those um, in order to have more people being able to have access to that, to that platform and that medium. Wonderful. Thank you. And as you mentioned about the typhoons in the Philippines, we were thinking about what we see in the news as they're bracing for a huge storm That's and true. the mobile technology possibly real life right now helping. Elizabeth, why don't you share about Axion San Diego? Sure. 
So uh, I'm going to bring us a little bit local uh, and give some examples. I'm actually going to introduce you to three of our entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, Maria, Paulina, and Haydel, who have been part of our loan program here locally. But I wanted to share, Axion at large is an international organization started back in the 60s and in Latin America and then brought pilot programs to New York City in 1991, really with a goal of providing micro loans to both startup and existing business owners that may not uh, have the criteria and qualifications to get traditional bank financing. So we're really working with entrepreneurs that either have no credit history, have past credit challenges, are startup businesses that don't have operating history, and have other barriers. They could be language or um, not knowledge of the financial system here in the United States, really to get the, themselves off the ground and running with a with a small business or to expand a business. And so uh, as some of the other panelists have mentioned, oftentimes internationally in microfinance, it is very heavily focused on women entrepreneurs. And um, here in San Diego and actually amongst the five offices within the United States of Axion that are across this country, we find actually that our, that our percentages are about half and half. So 50% women, 50% men who access our loan program to start or expand their businesses. And here in San Diego, just to give you a picture of the size and scope of my organization, we have 650 entrepreneurs and a portfolio of micro loans, uh, about $4.5 million. So our loans range as little as $300 and they go all the way up to $75,000. And so the criteria to go through that loan process, um, like I said, is much more flexible than a traditional bank is going to be. But despite that, and despite that additional risk that we actually take on as an organization, we have a 97% repayment rate. So we are working with these borrowers, and we attribute a lot of that to the relationships that we build with them. Because through our program, we not only provide that access to capital, but there's so many more wraparound services that are provided with education, resources, and training, which are empowering these people then to, to ultimately help them live out their dreams and be successful entrepreneurs. And so I'll start off with the first example. And each one of these entrepreneurs has come from a different walk of life. And the first is Maria Harrison, and she's the owner here locally of Tea Gallery. And her business uh, started out, she had a dream to be an entrepreneur. Her family is from, uh, from Asia, and she actually started importing loose leaf tea. And in the market here in San Diego, she found that there wasn't quite good quality loose leaf teas. And so she started blending her own loose leaf teas and importing them. And she started off at farmer's markets. And I think her husband got slightly frustrated with her at some point because in her living room, he didn't have a place to sit on the couch because she had all these boxes coming in of tea and you no, know, no space. So at some point, you know, she got busy enough where she needed a startup loan really to bring her business to the next level. And so she came to our loan program, got a small warehouse, started importing and fast forward a couple of years later, she's now been in three different warehouse spaces. She has a, she distributes in in many of the local restaurants and hotel chains here in San Diego, and she actually also sells her tea in Whole Foods and Sprouts. And she now today employs over 10 people. So um, it allowed her, she was a startup entrepreneur, a young female, she had a family, and it enabled her to be able to have a schedule that she was looking for, be able to have a lifestyle and a, a sustainable source of income for her family. So that's the first client that I share with you. The second, and I mentioned that we not only work with access to capital, but we also work with the education. And so a couple of years ago, we started seeing that a lot of people were coming to us with these great ideas of starting a business, but and they were asking for capital from us as an alternative lender. And we take risk, and we definitely take more risk than our traditional banking partners. But there would be this pool of people that they had a great idea and they had a skill set to apply, but even as alternative lenders, we 
weren't comfortable lending them money. And so together with six other nonprofit partners, we came up with an eight-week curriculum that's called the Axion Academy. And it's an eight-week program that we actually run entrepreneurs. And we have, I would say, about 50% men, 50% women who have participated in it. We've run four programs so far. And it basically walks them through at a very basic level every single step of starting a business. And it provides information on permitting, on market segmentation, on financial projections. But the thing about it is that they do it in class. So it's an eight-week program. And in order to actually graduate, they have to attend all eight weeks. And they have to actually, at the end of it, um, they do not go through our traditional underwriting. They actually, upon completion and graduation of that program, they have the ability to qualify for up to a $5,000 startup loan. And so the thing about the collaboration amongst that is that we have six different nonprofits that teach different por portions of the curriculum. And so we, rather than us reinvent the wheel, we are maximizing resources, bringing in community housing work works to teach financial stability and financial planning from a personal perspective, which affects business as well. And um, the second client that I'll share with you is Paulina. And she was in, in a very different walk of life. She had had a career. She had gotten laid off in the recession. And she she lost her job, was having trouble meeting her financial obligations, and ended up having to file bankruptcy. And she ultimately wanted to reinvent herself. And she found out about the Axion Academy through Community Housing Works, where she was getting credit and financial training. And she enrolled in the Axion Academy and, at the end of it, had a clear focus, a clear vision for her life coaching business. And she received a startup loan to actually uh, take over her her destiny and be in control of that as an entrepreneur. And the last example, one of the things that I think is really interesting about our community here in San Diego is we have this wonderful group of academic, nonprofit, and community-based organizations that formed a couple of years ago the San Diego Microfinance Alliance. And I always like to think of it as a, a landscape of resources for startup and existing entrepreneurs here in San Diego. And we work so collaboratively together between the universities and these local nonprofits that are either doing microfinance at some level, so providing the loans, or doing education training programs to these entrepreneurs. And the last example is a perfect demonstration of what the power of this microfinance alliance group is, is that... Um, Hey, Dell is a client who is from Iraq, and she came and got services through the International Rescue Committee, which is another nonprofit here locally that helps with different refugee and asylum uh, resettlement, as well as some other entrepreneurial services. And she came and and her skill set was to really start operating a daycare. And she had about eight children in the daycare in El Cajon, and she found a waiting list just outside her door with other families that were from her culture who wanted to be have their children being taken care of by her daycare. And so she came through our loan program and got an $8,000 loan to really purchase the additional equipment, toys, and the license to get her child care business up to 28 children. Uh, children and she's also hiring staff. So that's a really good example of someone that's come th through multiple organizations within the Microfinance Alliance uh, that through that collaboration we've been in, been enabled been able to empower these female entrepreneurs and it once again speaks to my initial comments about the fact that it's not just about the access to capital it's that butterfly effect that that affects the the entrepreneur themselves their their sustainable source of income and then their community and they also can hire staff and provide much needed services to the community and neighborhoods at large so i'll stop there roger you need to it's still on. Here's another one. Hello? 
Those were such um, tremendous presentations that I'm glad um, they were done without interruption. I'm essentially redundant at this point. Because with a couple of questions, it'll be 4.30 and we're done. However, I will, uh, let me try and uh, add one extra little thing into the, into the conversation. How many of you have been to the Salk Institute? Oh, Peter Salk is. <laughs> Where, when did you go? I mean, is this a... So um, as you walk into the Salk, you walk off over a quote of Jonas's, which says, You'll correct me if I'm wrong. Hope lies in dreams and imagination and in the courage of those who dare to make dreams into reality. And it struck me, listening to the talks, certainly the, the earliest talks this morning, that that was exactly what those people were talking about. They were talking about getting over hurdles and challenges and, 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 and achieving some sort of honorable delightful status in the world. And that's exactly what the scientist is doing, going into that lab, because that's essentially what Jonas was talking about. He was saying, there's challenges here. You're going to be sitting here for days on end doing th things which apparently produce no reward, and then there'll be this tremendous reward. You have to persevere. There has to be this hope, and there has to be this courage. Um, and it, it occurred to me that this is very much the theme that you have here, um, but I'd like to suggest a, a 5E meeting uh, using some of these terms. So one of the things I do in terms of, uh, of public engagement with science is precisely to do that, to engage. Because if you aren't engaging and you aren't another, aren't a, a real person to the other entity, then, then there's no conversation going on, there's no dialogue. This is what Becky Pettit was talking about this morning in terms of custodians, if they're just faceless wonders in the corner. So there has to be this engagement. So that's the first E, the engagement. I think there has to be this encouragement, and that's where I put the word courage into it, encouragement. I think there has to be education. I mean, this is immensely important. And then, with those things, then you are indeed empowered. You are not cynically told to become empowered. Uh, there's, there's a certain humility in watching the process happen, I think. I thought you made a great point there, Craig, by the way. And finally, uh, the, fi the fifth E, I think, is, is uh, enjoyment. Because uh, if it's not fun, it's, uh, which is what I like about this meeting. It's been tremendous. Now, can I just, just, just bring in one, one, one point only, which is... Um, oh, you talked about humility, by the way. Um, I just, we were going to ask them all to give a quote to begin with, some one of their favorite quotes. So I, I was thinking about one. We didn't actually do that. We might do it at the end. But the, I love this line from Eliot, T.S. Eliot, um, uh, uh, the four quartets. He said, the only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the wisdom of humility. Humility is endless. So thank you for prompting that thought in my mind. Um, this, two days ago, uh, at, on the forecourt of the Salk, there was a press conference and then a, a, a meeting to discuss this thing, which is the economic impact of San Diego's research institutions. It was the first financial assessment of what's going on in this area, done by the EDC. And um, it, was, it was quite remarkable. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it simply says here, research institutions have a $4.6 billion economic impact in this town. That's the, why they made this analogy, I, I don't know, but they said that's equivalent to 34 San Diego Comic Cons, <laughs> or 33 US Open Golf Championships, uh, six aircraft carriers, but 4.6 billion is a lot of money. San Diego is the most concentrated scientific R&D market in the United States. Number one best place to launch a startup, 2014, Forbes magazine. Uh, number one uh, metro area for NIH research dollars to research institutes, 2014. Uh, and a whole bunch of other things. It, this, it, it, this is a global nexus, life sciences. It's, it's also a global neuro nexus. So I'm saying here, science is a big deal. And I will then vault onto the topic of women in science. 
um, because that's somewhat intriguing and interesting to me. You're talking about entrepreneurs. I mean, I, I happen to have these. These are the last two issues. This is Fortune, 50 most powerful women. Um, that's what they do with a copy. That's what they, they, they do to, to women. Here's, here's Iron Inc. Um, Elizabeth Holmes on the cover, um, eight women who could own the future. So great emphasis on using women iconically to suggest there's a dramatic change going on. And, and perhaps there is, but it's certainly in terms of women in science, I don't know about that. And, and, and I actually just looked in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a journal that you will all know well. Um, and in this latest issue, there is, astonishingly, a paper compared with the title of it is Compared to Men, Women View Professional Advancement as Equally Attainable but Less Desirable. I'm going to read this significance portion to you because then I want them to talk to me about this. We identify a profound and consistent gender gap in people's core life goals. Across nine studies using diverse sample populations, executives in high power positions, recent graduates of a top MBA program, undergraduate students and online panels of working adults and over 4,000 participants, we find that compared to men, women have a higher number of life goals place less importance on power-related goals, associate more negative outcomes, i.e. time constraints and trade-offs, with high power positions, perceive power as less desirable, and are less likely to take advantage of opportunities for professional advancement. Women view high-level positions as equally attainable as men do, but less desirable which is something that you mentioned earlier on from, the, from yeah. three decades ago. Mm -hmm. This is last week. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one point I want to bring up if we've got time, because I think it's a hugely significant point. And perhaps we'll stick on that and not do the women in science thing. Could, could you all speak to that one? Because it's, it's kind of a clunker. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is interesting to note that, I mean, within academia, there are many sub-disciplines that are increasingly female-dominated, mm -hmm. right? So the hard sciences are not one of them, but yeah. sociology, anthropology, within even economics, there are uh, more social science and more kind of physics-like parts of economics. And I guess I should be proud to say that of, I would say that more than half of the people who I find to be incredibly intellectually intimidating in my field now are, are women. Uh, <sighs> So, uh, yes. so <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> the people who really make me sweat when I have to present in front of them, yeah. So, um, so, so things are shifting fast in academia writ large and in mm -hmm. the research community as a whole. Uh, hard science, as you say, is a particularly problematic area. Same issue, and then, then I think you want to say something on this, don't you? Um, same issue, there was actually a piece by uh, a science writer called Science and Culture Making a Pitch for Female Engineers, which engineering, I was just talking earlier to Ramesh Rao and also to Nik Nikhil Jain, who's vice president for wearables. Um, these two checks here are are going to young women who are in, in engineering departments. So, so that's sort of my interesting transition there. But um, bleh. Yeah, sure. Um, I agree with what you just said. And um, you know, this is what I'm trying to say was earlier, too, in different ways, is are there professions, hierarchies, patriarchies, that make it difficult for women to succeed at the level they want to because the cultural, social, familial expectations remain the same. That is, they are very, very gendered. And I did time allocation studies. I'm an anthropologist, and I was recording women's um, work from the minute they woke up till they slept, and I compared it with the men, and the men had five hours of leisure per day, and the women had zero. 
So when we talk about the hard sciences, whatever that is, because it's a way of also assuming that humanities and social scientists are so, our sciences are soft, which I don't know what that means either, I would like to see a bridging at some level where these gender disparities are discussed in a larger framework and not in the hard scientific methodological manner. Methodology is very important to me. And come up with some solutions where the male scientists can meet the women scientists halfway to take on the social responsibility of global humanitarianism, global humanity development, etc. Mm -hmm. And then do the research again to see who is aspiring for what and succeeds in what. Thank you. Yeah, I think, the, the, I think what's good about this um this meeting is, is, the, is the beginnings here of bringing together those somewhat sophisticated academic analyses and also the stories that we heard yeah, as well. In MIT, they measured the room size of the offices and they found the women scientists had much smaller offices. I mean, like, come on, that is something you need to be aware of, yeah, you know. Yeah. But, but again, I mean, the, the personal touch as well. I mean, when, when, the, when some of the early speeches were happening this morning, I, I found my mind going back to the fact that when I was growing up in England, um, we were just extraordinarily poor. And my shirts were made for me by, by, on a little sewing machine by one of the parents. And, and it, uh, there was a last and shoes were made. And all this done was, and it was my father who did it. It was, it was just an extraordinary memory to come back and realize that this man who was a uh, you know, Royal Air Force officer and a pilot and so on was also making little boy shirts. So I was, thought that was very cool. Now, do you have a Qualcomm well, story? I, was, I, I do have one story. So after all of my years, I've been with Qualcomm 10 years, all my years working with um, women entrepreneurs in developing countries, and just in this last um, couple of years, I've had the opportunity to look here in the United States, here within our company at Qualcomm, looking at the number of women in technical positions um, recognizing the need to set some realistic um, goals and to make some significant strides in the right direction. Um, we're constantly told that there's a lack, uh, there's a pipeline issue. There just aren't enough women in science, technology, engineering, and math. And you know what? At the top universities, there are plenty, as, yeah. as this gentleman yeah. and you said, there are plenty of incredibly intelligent women. Uh, another excuse has been, um, you know, they just, girls, that aren't interested in that type of thing from a young age. Well, um, for the last couple of summers, we have d been disproving that at Qualcomm. We've been hosting a Q Camp for Girls in STEM for girls in the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, uh, coming back each summer for two weeks at a time. These girls, the last summer that they were here, um, as their final gift, they received an Arduino kit, which is like a little robotics kit. And when they received that, they all felt so empowered and so confident and so comfortable in their skin yeah, as being so little cool. girls studying technology and engineering that when they received that gift, it was like, you know that feeling of being a girl and squealing when you get something you really want? So it can happen. Girls are interested in science. They're successful in science and technology and engineering. We just have to put them forward and give them the opportunity to succeed. Yeah. Um, Nikhil Jane, you're at the back, right? I, I, we're not going to be able to get to it because it's, we're overrunning. But I mean, one thing you, I did ask you when I was with Ramesh Rao, also who's just about to present these things, uh, was why there were so few en women engineers. I think Ramesh said it was about 16% at the moment, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, and your answer was that your daughter had now gone into computer, correct me if I'm wrong, has now gone into computer science, but when she was actually thinking of doing engineering or when people are doing engineering, it was not so good for them to spend so much time alone, just singly working away. And engineers, it, it, your, your analysis was that perhaps, um, perhaps guys were more suited to doing that than, than women who needed more company. Was that, am I paraphrasing or? Just a random observation. <laughs> <laughs> and then, this, then we'll go to the... Um, uh, so I have two daughters, and I'm trying to make them both engineers. And <laughs> <laughs> because I think in, in, engineering is fun. 
but what I recognized about my elder daughter, who's a computer science major at Berkeley, um, that uh, what she loves about engineering is this ability to build things. What she hates about engineering is the hours that she has to work alone. And uh, so she's looking for this way to create the social connection. And you know, there's, there are more hormones that need to be fired to satisfy her, which engineering doesn't seem to provide it. And that was my statement to you. I, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so at this point, I think we just have to thank the panel uh, for some yeah. wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.